Okay. So welcome everyone to this uh, Saturday session, which is the third in our series of We Are Working On. Uh, we've done one on um, fossil fuel companies. We've done one on the funders of uh, fossil fuel destruction. And this one is on mobilization and engagement, uh, and particularly thinking about how we engage uh, our church communities. So uh, let's just uh, begin with a prayer. Um, and I can't remember whether it's Julie, it's, it's Kathy who's going to open in prayer. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, um, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this group and the people and ideas within it. Thank you for listening and learning, love and justice, truth and action. Thank you for the people online here today and those busy elsewhere, marching on the streets, imprisoned or at home. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to guide us, to commit us to seeing and seeking your kingdom and your kingdom come on earth. Breathe on us, inspire us, to plant the trees under which we will not sit, to plant the seeds to flourish in our lifetimes and after. Help us to be your beloved children, to act with others who are awakening, to revere the earth, each other and all of creation. Amen. Amen. Thank you so um, I'm going to just hand over in a second to Jonathan Sterling, who's going to talk about the enormous amount of work that he's been doing in terms of mobilisation within the Anglican Church. Um, Jonathan, is there anything more you want me to say about that or are you ready to go? He's ready to go. OK. If you just unmute yourself and it's all yours. All right. Thank you. Um, well, that was a wonderful prayer, by the way, Kathy, that you started us off with. So thanks so much for that. Uh, right, just finding my presentation. Okay, and then... Right, is that working? You can see see the presentation? Oh, I've got some thumbs up. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I, I only got involved with Christian Climate Action towards um, the start of this year. And the action I'm going to talk about is um, one of the first things I've been involved in. And around the end of June, someone mentioned to me that the Lambeth Conference was coming up in a month's time. And it could be a good opportunity to reach out to the Anglican bishops. Um, so the Lambeth Conference takes place once a decade. The Archbishop of Canterbury hosts the bishops from all around the world for a week's worth of discussions and reflections on their shared life of faith. Um, you can see them all there in the photo. Um, it's a consultative form, forum only. Um, each province within the Anglican Communion have their own synods that make their own decisions. Um, most of this conference was going to take place on the campus of the University of Kent in Canterbury. But around halfway through, the bishops were going to have a, a day out in London. They're coming down to Lambeth Palace and they're going to have an environment themed day. And I found out that Melanie was going to be organising a prayer vigil for Christian Climate Action outside Lambeth Palace on that day. So I decided it'd be worth emailing all the bishops prior to them turning up to the conference. And I ended up writing to around 800 bishops altogether. Um, and I actually wrote to them three times in the weeks and days ahead of, of, of the prayer vigil. So I sent out over 2000 emails altogether. Um, and I sort of individually addressed each of these emails to a specific bishop. So it was sort of several days sat at a computer to, to finish all this. Um, I told the bishops that around a dozen members of Christian Climate Action would be praying and bearing witness outside Lambeth Palace during their environment day. 
and I invited them to come out to meet and pray with us. I also mentioned about the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, the Vatican had just said that they were going to sign this, and some members of CCA were keen that the Anglican churches also sign up to this treaty. And the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, it takes account of the needs of the planet to get out of fossil fuels as quickly as possible, alongside the needs of the global south, that the countries are currently dependent on fossil fuels and will require support to diversify away from them. Well, by the time of the prayer vigil, I'd heard back directly from over 50 of the bishops, and this was from around 20 different countries. And many of them were keen to meet up with us at the vigil. Um, the largest contingent of replies I received back from were around a dozen bishops from South Sudan. And this included one of their archbishops, uh, Moses Dengbo, and he asked for our help in raising the profile of their campaign to save the sued wetlands. And a lot of water from these wetlands was going to be diverted to Egypt in a deal that had been made between the two governments. And this would mean that both the farmers and the wildlife were going to suffer in that part of South Sudan if this deal went ahead. When the planning meetings for the prayer vigil, it was decided we wouldn't be confrontational. For example, we wouldn't be sitting on the road or blowing our hands to anything. Um, as the bishops were going into Lambeth Palace to discuss the environment, it didn't seem to make sense to try to stop them from doing that. We, we also weren't sure where the police would allow us to stand. So in my emails, I told the bishops we'd be standing as close to the entrance as possible. We decided the main focus should be to stand in solidarity with the global south, seeing as at least half the bishops who were there would be from these countries. And these countries, of course, are already on the front line of the climate emergency. We also decided we wanted to show support for the South Sudan bishops and their campaign. So two of the new banners you can that were made for the vigil, you can see there, was Climate inaction equals racism and speak out. So directed at the, at the bishops to be speaking out. And another banner that we made was um, save the sued wetland. And we decided we'd give this to Archbishop Moses uh, when we met him. As well as receiving replies from the bishops about a week before the vigil, um, I suddenly got an email from a couple of the event organizers for the Environment Day. And they asked to have a Zoom meeting with us, which Melanie and I attended. It turned out that several of the bishops had approached the event organizers to ask when they could come out to spend time with us at the vigil. And the organizers' main concern seemed to be to check that we weren't going to be too disruptive to their proceedings. And they also emphasized that once the bishops were inside Lambeth Palace, they had a full schedule that they're expected to attend. So basically, they didn't want the bishops to be wandering off trying to go and find us in the middle of that. Um, <clears throat> so we were told that there wouldn't be time for the bishops to meet us on their way into Lambeth Palace, but there should be time at the end of the day. And we were also given the phone number of one of the event organisers to liaise with. And my impression was that it seemed his main job on the day was to make sure the bishops were where they were meant to be. Well, I thought I'd just um, share with you one of the quotes from, um, there's about 15 bishops who provided quotes for the CCA um, press release that Holly put together for the prayer vigil. This is from um, the Bishop of Hereford. It has been a joy to meet so many bishops from around the communion at the Lambeth Conference. However, it's been striking that every conversation has mentioned the effects of climate change in their diocese, from the Arctic to the Pacific. This is an emergency and time is running out. Well, on the day of the vigil itself, 
like everything that Melanie is involved with, it was very well organized. So we're all in place outside Lambeth Palace by 9 a.m., even though the event it's for the Environment Day itself wasn't getting underway until around midday. The organizers hadn't told us which way the bishops would be coming into the building. Um, so we sort of made sure that we had two entrances covered uh, just to make sure either way that they get to see us. Um, round at the main entrance, uh, we had a few people wandering in early, including a very unassuming Archbishop of York and his wife, who stopped for a brief chat. Um, one of the bishops had emailed me to let me know the timings of when all the coaches would be setting off from Canterbury. Um, and it was about half past 10 when the first of these coaches arrived. Bishops were dropped off around the side of the palace and then directed to the main entrance where we were standing with our banners. And as I, when I've been liaising with Archbishop Moses, he said he and the other bishops from South Sudan would plan to get on one of the first coaches to leave Canterbury, and then there would definitely be enough time for them to meet with us prior to when the Environment Day started. And I told him that we'd made some banners and posters to publicise the Save the Sud wetlands campaign. So as the bishops arrived at the entrance, um, I saw the event organiser who was tasked with getting the bishops to where they're meant to be. He was directing them sort of straight past us and into the palace. However, I recognised Archbishop Moses and I called out to him and he immediately came over. Um, you can probably see him here, he's sort of holding on to the Save the Suit wetland um, banner that we'd made. I actually gave him a big hug. He's, he's quite an impressive looking man. He's almost seven feet tall, sort of towering over the proceedings. And he's very happy to see us all there. And he called to the other bishops to also come and join us. So this stage was not much the event organizer could do about it. He, he just allowed the bishops to spend time with us. We spoke and prayed together and posed for some photos. As we were finishing chatting with the South Sudan bishops, Another coach had pulled up and the next load of bishops were coming around the corner. So some of them came over to see what we're all doing there. Um, and some of these bishops were also ones I've been in correspondence with. And so they were expecting to come and spend a bit of time with us on, on their way in. Well, by this time, the event organiser looked a lot more relaxed. He, he saw that it was um, a positive interaction between ourselves and the bishops. And also they're only spending about five or 10 minutes with us. And then they were heading obediently inside the palaces as they're expected to do. Um, I also only saw one policeman while we were standing outside the palace. He went inside the entrance to have a chat to someone and then came outside again and left. And by mid morning, one of the event organizers had brought out a crate of cool bottled water uh, for us to drink. So I was encouraged that there were obviously people inside Lambeth Palace who are very supportive of our presence there. The prayer vigil turned out to be a very positive experience for all concerned. And I think it helped that we had a captive audience as the, the bishops had to file past us to get into the building. There are also all away from their familiar settings in their own diocese. So my impression was that they could be a bit freer and more relaxed. It became a very informal occasion. Uh, I remember putting my arms around a few of them as we spent some time in prayer. And it felt to me that um, Christian Climate Action's presence there was a much needed witness of what was happening to our planet. I felt like we we're almost the conscience of the lay people in what was a very obviously ordained dominated group that sort of spent this whole week in their deliberations. And this was a chance for the bishops to, to speak to some ordinary people. As well as myself, I think there are a couple of others um, there who are new to Christian climate action protests. And so this was a great first action for us all to be involved with. Uh, I'd also come along with 
my young son and daughter and a nephew and niece who I was responsible for that week. And it was a positive experience for, for them too. And the children proved to be a bit of a magnet for the bishops who, who enjoyed talking to them. Archbishop Moses, here he is. He actually tied the Save the Sued Wetland banner that we'd made for him. And he, he wore it the whole time that he was at the Environment Day. One long-term member of Christian Climate Action, reflecting on the, how the day was unfolding, she, she commented that we were treating the bishops just like ordinary people, and that the ones who have been in correspondence with were particularly friendly with us, um, as they've been expecting to come and spend time with us. And it reminded her of a previous initiative by CCA a few years back, when they wrote to every member of the Church of England's General Synod, I think it was before a big vote that was related to fossil fuel divestment. And again, because they'd been contacted prior to the event, several of the General Synod members had greeted the CCA members warmly when they'd met them. But reflecting on this myself, I, I think this action was a helpful in that as well as humanizing the bishops, it also helped to humanize us, the protesters. So the Church of England bishops, um, many of them might have been present at the General Synod this year when, I think it was sort of just the month before July, um, Christian Climate Action members were uh, did a peaceful demonstration and disrupted the proceedings of the Synod. Um, demanding divestment from fossil fuel companies. So those powerful actions that, that we undertake quite regularly, um, by necessity, they involve an element of uh, peaceful confrontation and, and surprise. So by contrast, here at Lambeth Palace, there's a chance for the bishops to meet members of Christian action, climate action in a less tense atmosphere, almost on equal terms. And hear why we were so passionate for, for action on the climate by the church. Um, well, since the Lambeth conference, um, I've sort of decided I'm a, an honorary member of the Persistent Widow Club, if you think of um, Jesus' parable, where the, the widow keeps asking the judge for um, justice. So I've now undertaken a, a further three iterations of emails, but I've focused on the Church of England bishops. There's only around 100 of them, so it's a bit more manageable. Um, and as a result of these follow-up emails, I've heard back from a few bishops who've said that they're going to, that they have actually signed up to the mailing list for Christian Climate Action um, to receive updates. And a few of the bishops said that they hope to join us in one of our acts of public witness. And around 10 bishops have said that their dioceses are now considering whether to sign the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And yesterday, I received this email from the Bishop of Norwich. So this is a brand new news for everyone. Um, dear Jonathan, so by the way, Bishop of Norwich, he's the lead bishop on the environment for the Church of England. He writes, thank you for your notes and the links you've provided. I can confirm that the Church of England's Environmental Working Group agreed to sign the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty at its September meeting, as it is closely aligned to the Lambeth Conference draft environmental call. With all good wishes and every blessing, Bishop Graham. And also, you, you might be wondering about Archbishop Moses Deng. Well, an interview with him was included in an article, again published yesterday in the Church Times, with the headline, Saving the Sood on the Front Line for the Waterline. So this article begins, as hundreds of bishops from the Anglican Communion entered Lambeth Palace to discuss the climate ecological crisis, they were met with the imposing figure of the Archbishop of Northern Bar El Ghazal and Bishop of War in South Sudan, the most reverend Moses Dengbol. Standing almost seven feet tall, the Archbishop was flanked by protesters from Christian Climate Action, urging the church leaders to use their positions to advocate for greater action on climate change. And they were brandishing a large blue banner that read, Save the Sued Wetland. So I think we have 
really helped him with his request as well of um, sort of promoting the, the Save the Seed wetlands um, campaign that they have. So I'll just uh, finish now with letting the Archbishop have the final words, actually. So Archbishop Moses, at the end of the article that was published yesterday in the Church Times, he says, creation care was fundamental to faith. As Christians, we must take care of the environment, the mandate God gave us since creation. In fact, it's the very reason why God created human beings, according to Genesis. Christians working together to protect the environment is powerful. Organisations like Christian Climate Action can unite Christians from different denominations around the world to speak with one voice for environmental protection, as we did at Lambeth Palace. Okay, well, I'll hand back now to, to Manly. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think you just need to stop your screen share. That's brilliant. So that was really, really uh, amazing action. And um, Jonathan was so powerful in writing to all the bishops. One of the things that's really important to take away from that is the way that we can just by sitting at a computer make such a difference uh, to our actions on the streets. So there's, there's scope for everyone to do everything from coming out and joining us on the streets to taking the sorts of, uh, I mean, that was entirely Jonathan's initiative. He had this idea and he took it forward and he ran with it. So, you know, there you go. When you have an idea, go with it. That's the power of God in you. So uh, we're going to sort of uh, move our focus a little bit to talking about um, talks that we can give in churches and to hear from uh, Julie and from Kathy about um, the interactions they've had within their churches and their denominations. Julie, I think you're going first and you have also got a little um, slideshow for us. So I'm going to go back on to mute and hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Jonathan. That was so good, and I hadn't seen those those photos. And um, and to think it's in the Church Times this week. I mean, that's, that's staggering. So well done. That's absolutely brilliant. It's um, that was really uh, interesting to hear. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely brilliant. So um, what I'm talking about is something quite different in a way, I suppose. But um, most of you, or well, not all of you, will know that we did a walk for COP26, which of course is exactly a year ago. So I must admit in preparing for this, it was quite emotional having looking back at all the pictures and everything and what we, we did and what we achieved and, and everything last year. Um, so what I did when I came back, I mean, I told my church what I was doing <laughs> and they were praying for me while I was walking the 500 miles to Glasgow. Um, but when I came back, obviously, I thought I should give a presentation uh, to the church to show them all the pictures and how it was. And they were very interested um, in, well, in what we did and, and how it happened. And that, uh, particularly, they were interested in, in the actual physicality of how, you know, a core of about 20 people, which some days went up to 70 or 80, actually walked 500 miles where we stayed and how we coped with it all. Um, so some of this shows a bit of sort of my personal reflections or a sort of summary. This is just a few of the slides from the whole thing, because otherwise I'll be here forever. <laughs> um, well, it, it took about an hour to do the talk. And also I'm very fortunate in this. I've got a lot of the uh, memorabilia, if you like, from the COP. Um, in fact, behind me, but you can't see it, but I might show you later if you want. Oh, I've got to put my hat on, otherwise you won't recognise me, because this is the hat that I wore all the time. So this is my... Um, walking hat <laughs> and um, so um, so when I did these talks um, I was very fortunate that Helen and Melanie lent me stuff so I've actually got the original flags that we carried I've got all the leaflets that we have obviously I haven't got the code of hopes but I've got some of the patches that we put on the code of hopes um, so I was able to show everybody um, and also I took my camper van called Phoebe um, to carry some of this stuff and uh, so I took that along as well. I did two, I did a talk to my church and then somebody asked me to come and talk at a girls school to, to their sixth form which actually was very interesting talking to teenage girls who were 
um, obviously aware of climate change. And again, they were fascinated by what we'd done and how we were trying to secure the future for them. And they were very interested. So I'll just show you a few of the um, slides to uh, for those who did do it or didn't do it and, uh, as, and remind myself how it all happened a year ago. Uh, right. I hope, there we are. Right. Um, sorry, I'm just working out how I can get it onto, because that's in the way now, to get it to actually flow. Uh, slideshow at the moment. Beginning. Right, I need that to be out of the way. Okay. So um, this was what we were doing, Camino to COP, walking for climate justice. And it wasn't just CCA, it was Faithbridge. So we had with us not just Christians from CCA, but Buddhists and uh, Jews, Stephen, um, and well, all faith. And some people of, of no, well, no, not no faith, but it was, um, we were an, an interesting group of people. And we weren't just CCA, we weren't just, just Christians, although it was organized, um, obviously. Uh, by well not obviously it was organized by CCA. So how it all started um, for those of you who weren't uh, aware uh, January 21 a few people have this mad idea many many of course um, how we could walk 500 miles how long would it take how could it be done who would do it etc and uh, so that was the beginning back in the January. I do remember we had sort of working group meetings and things, so it's quite amazing. So here we are starting uh, in Parliament Square, September, oh God, I'm gonna forget the date now, I think it was the 14th. Somebody will tell me afterwards, I'll know it was before that, but in September, anyway, um, last year. And uh, so we started um, there and I've got the flag I'm not, I've got the flag behind me sitting here, so I've got that flag with me if you wanted to see it. And when I gave the talks, people were fascinated to actually see the flags that we carried and the state that they're in now. <laughs> They've been carried 500 miles. Um, so there were lots of us there, lots of press uh, as we started. Um, yeah, all right. I didn't mean to show this bit, but. Oh, right. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so here we are going through Hyde Park, carrying that look at a clean flag. Goodness, it looks a bit different now. Um, and how much just to give you an idea of how many there were when we started, there were hundreds of us that started off on our grand walk. Um, then I showed people <laughs> pictures of us. On our way, we stayed in various churches, church halls, anybody that would have us really, um, uh, which was a lot of organisation for the people who were organising this. And, and this shows you the core of people. There was a core of about 20 that walked the whole way. Um, and uh, out of that, I think there were two or three, Melanie was one of them, who actually, well, maybe not you, Kathy, um, walked the whole way, stayed the whole time and slept every night on the floor in a sleeping bag. And um, so uh, there were a lot of us and that's all the gang. <laughs> um, so yes, I don't know why I picked lots of, we didn't rain every day, but we did have quite um, a weather obviously going up north, you know, it's like up north. Um, so, uh, so there's various just pictures of us, how we had to Dip, you know, and it was quite a thing to discover what was waterproof and what wasn't. Uh, we had to go over bridges, um, below, uh, alongside canals. Now, every day we had lots of people who joined us for day walkers and bringing their dogs, as you can see. So it wasn't, there was a core of us, but also there were people who joined us each day, which was lovely, um, who walked um, that day with us. And we were giving out leaflets all the time. I think I've got one later that shows you that. 
Um, so we were spreading the word, you know, that what we were doing, people were interested, asking us as we went past people, you know, why are you doing it? Most people thought we we're mad. Um, I'll show, I will, have I got time? I will show a bit of this video because it just shows right on a nice dry day as well, that this is the start of the walk. People were starting out the front and there, Stephen showing you all the, the leaflets there. But if you look back, you can see how long, sometimes we had 70 people walking with us um, or even more. I think, I think 70 was the highest number we ever had. So it was a lot of people to uh, walk, spread the word um, all along the way uh, of what we were doing. Um, and you can see in the distance, way down there, the back, the rear end of it all. Um, and uh, most of the time it was fun. It was challenging at times, but you know, it was good to walk. You had to carry all your stuff. Let's see if I can get out of that. Oh no. <laughs> oh, I don't seem to be able to get out of it. Sorry. Oh, here we are. Yes, I am. Um, some of the banners we carried, so people came from all over the country to walk with us. We weren't just people from London. And um, I'm not sure which church this was, but people brought with them these flags and they were had the names of all the people who were praying for them and from their church um, who were supporting us on our way. Uh, so there were quite a few of these um, blue flags that were carried as well. Um, yeah. Uh, there's all of us again. I can't remember which church that was. I can't read it either. Um, but there you can see the coat, the coat of hopes, if you haven't heard about that. I've got the arrow on that. There's Barbara, who idea the coat of hopes was. Um, yeah, and all of us. <laughs> so in the evenings, we did outreach. We talked to the local community about what we were doing. Melanie, of course, there. Um, to and they were the people who was who were supporting us by um, looking after us while we were there and giving us accommodation and feeding us. So it was very important to talk to them about what we were doing and why. And there's we've had them split into groups there talking about it, and we we would sit with a group and talk to them about what we were doing. Um, sometimes the accommodation was challenging, <laughs> so this was the one particularly awful night to be honest where um actually i think we're in scotland then where sometimes it was very very cozy as you can see so um so there was great sacrifices what i'm trying to say from lots of people not for me personally because i was in my camper van um but that's that gives you an idea of what uh, the um wonderful caministers had to put up with and here's melanie nearly well everywhere we went we were welcome yeah i won't talk about somewhere we weren't but, um, and that was, you know, that's the welcome we got as we traveled north. Um, some of the things that we, you know, I mentioned some of the flags, marches, well, we were taking this ginkgo um, tree with us, which had come all the way from Bristol. It was carried by Michael here. Um, and it's one of the, it's an old fossilized tree species. And we carried it all the way to Glasgow and it got planted in Glasgow and is now doing very well in a garden there. So that was, that again symbolic and symbolise all the people's hopes that a fossilised tree will hopefully survive the climate uh, action. Also, I put this in because it's me wearing the coat, but the coat travelled every day. Uh, we uh, wore it every day. It had its own raincoat as well. Um, and those were the very early days when we hadn't got a lot of patches. But if you don't know about the coat of hope, these patches were made by churches and people all over the country and were sent to go on this coat of hopes, which we took all the way to Glasgow. Oh, here we are putting them on. So as we got closer to Glasgow, people kept sending, we had to have mass sewings. Um, there was a whole load of people who did all the sewing and putting all the patches on, but we were getting frantic towards the end. So we just, all of us were putting the patches on, ready for our entrance into Glasgow. And here we go, we got into Scotland, which was obviously a big uh, event and it wasn't raining too bad that day um and here we are in glasgow because even though we're in scotland we still had another week's work a week's walk and melon is wearing the coat and you can see we've managed to sew nearly all the things on and there's barbara there and of course the press so this is in a park in glasgow we led 
the um, march into Glasgow from people who had travelled all over, who had walked from all different places in Europe. And we all met here for a big march in. And it stretched a long way back. And it's a really big event. As Melanie's singing the song. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you, Melanie, lots, you can tell. <laughs> right, what do we do while we were there? Because, of course, that starts today, which is what I thought of this. We held prayer vigils. Just like um, Jonathan was saying how important prayer is and prayer vigils. So every day we were praying different places in Glasgow. Um, and also we, Helen Burnett, managed to join us on Zoom to people around the country who couldn't walk with us, but were also praying with us. So the whole event was surrounded, or based on a lot of prayer. Um, this is all our CCA people before we went on the march on the second day, I think, or third day. So we had a lot of us up there, which was very encouraging. And here we are on the walk. So walk the walk, COP26. That's what uh, our aim was. And that gives you an idea. There were, I think, over 10,000 people in the march. I mean, we obviously occupied the whole of Glasgow, basically. It was very, very emotional. It's very, um, yeah, it's good. Very good witness. And then every day, Barbara, bless her, took the coat of hopes, walked from the centre of Glasgow out to the, I'm going to get the name on, the blue zone. There were two zones, a green zone and the blue zone. Blue zone was where all the delegates went. We couldn't have access to that. As you could see there was lots of security. Um, but um, every day, Barbara and at least a, a dozen people went, sang. We met people going in and out. The delegates were very... Um, engaged very positively with us, a bit like Jonathan was saying, people were really impressed that we were there. Um, and it was it was lovely to think this was happening. And at the same time, we have people around the, t the city of Glasgow praying as well. Um, and, I, you know, it was a, a really good witness. Then actually in the green zone, which is where um, non-delegates were allowed to go, we did a play at the end um, showing the whole of our walk and uh, to um, people who came and listened to the um, play. So in conclusion, going back to our sort of movement building, church engagement, and well, as I did that in this in the church, uh, mobilization, um, what did we achieve? The feedback from delegates, a bit like Jonathan was saying, was, was they appreciated a constant presence, and so it's every day, made them think more and gave them hope. And only God really knows, who knows the effect of all our prayers, witness and struggles, but it was important that we were there. So, oh, what now? So I thought very important, which I've passed on to be. We, we have a vigil every Wednesday outside Parliament. And of course, as you all know, there's been just, just stop all going on. And then as I did this back in uh, January, I was saying, you know, join us. Okay, so I'll stop that. Um, so, Thank you, Julie. Uh, we're running really over time. Oh, I'm now. sorry. Right. Thank so you. I'm just going to need to. I know you wanted to show flags and things, but no, uh, no, no, it's fine. I'm just going to. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you, Julie, because that is another example, both of the ways that we mobilise uh, and. Um, as well as the opportunities that gives us then to do talks in our churches and um, that idea for walking to Glasgow was just simply a small group of people that got on with it and did it and again uh, it's just an example of what people can do when they put their minds to it um, and it we talked to well over 50 different church communities about getting involved in this, about stepping up into their power. So uh, another example, something you can do. And Cathy, I'm now going to hand straight over to you, because Cathy, I think you're going to talk a bit more about giving talks, aren't you? And some of the talks that you've... Yeah, I am. But I was just going to say, Mel, I'm quite happy if you think it would be, because we've got about 12 minutes, if you think it'd be better if we sort of do questions for Jonathan and Julie and I can do the talk another week. I'm no, quite... no, no, no. Let's go, let's go on with this and then we'll do all the questions together. Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to try screen sharing. Uh, oh, it says only the host can share in this meeting. I'm sorry, my computer kicked me out and back in again. Um, 
I'll start and do you mind making me a host again? I think that's what's happened. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, cool. I'm now a co-host. <laughs> okay, let's see if this will um let's see if this will work at the same time. So I'm part of the URC. Um, so I am going to give you a slightly different view on a slightly different view, I think. I can't seem to share, it was struggling earlier. I can't seem to share this document because it wants to be a different wants to be a different uh <laughs> it wants to be a different file format unfortunately let's have a look see if it'll work like this it's ah uh, i think i've got it it's a complex way of doing it has that worked yeah it has excellent. indeed yeah excellent okay fantastic so um i'm going to talk briefly about three things one is the United Reformed Church tent at Greenbelts. One is kind of discipleship and networking, and one is an Our Faith, Our Planet event. So I um, basically uh, got quite lucky where I ended up in the United Reformed Church. I left the Church of England two years ago after various different things happened to me and I needed to change denomination. And when I entered the United Reformed Church, um, I kind of got quite involved in what was going on. and. Um, the United Reformed Church secretary for my church, which is an ecumenical one. And that kind of slightly boring role of passing information all over the place actually means that I pay more attention to the information I get. And so what happened was I noticed in a newsletter um, a call out for people to volunteer with the United Reformed Church at Greenbelt. Um, and so that was um, something that I was really interested in. I love the Greenbelt Festival. I think most people have heard of it and you can look it up. I had no idea what would be involved at the time, but I will actually do anything for a festival ticket. Um, so we were contacted for a meeting about volunteering in the spring this year and knew there were kind of three areas, a cafe with volunteers, a crafts area and programmes. And the programme team focuses were environment, racial justice and well-being. So I immediately knew that I was, should be in the programmes team because of the knowledge I've gained from being part of CCA actually about environmental activism and about what's going on with the planet um, in terms of the climate crisis and social justice and ecological crises going on simultaneously. So I got involved in the planning and immediately saw that there was kind of quite a few gaps where it would be great if people could come into this tent. I should explain a bit about the tent. It's a cafe and it's an indoor space, which is really helpful at festivals, either when it's sunny like this year or when it's raining. And people are very much drawn there for a bit of shelter and a bit of food. And so I thought it'd be a great space to be and also for CCA to take part in if there was room. Um, so I started talking to the programme organiser, um, who um, you can see there in the corner, Rue, I seem to be pointing at him, but I'm not. <laughs> um, and he uh, was kind of really on board with this idea. So I started chatting to Mel and asking, can we borrow some CCA people? And in the end, we had three people giving 10 minute tales. I'm really sorry, I didn't take any photos. So these are photos my friends have sent of me. The other people who did it were Kate, Gray and Drew, which was fantastic. So we got quite an overview. And then Sandy in the evening did a fantastic arrestables session for the sundown session. So it really worked. I just saw an opportunity and it really worked working in tandem together with the URC. And it felt like a really kind of, um, a really good space for that to happen, basically. It was, it's slightly radical, the, UR, the URC anyway. And so it kind of fits with people being able to come in. And then very kindly the next day, Mel agreed, pretty last minute, it was so kind of you, to come and do a talk on anti-racism, racial justice and the climate. Um, and so basically there was just a space which CCA kind of, I saw the links immediately and felt CCA would fill it brilliantly. It felt like quite a God-given opportunity and it came about pretty naturally. Um, I also um, did have to, to fight a little bit against being sideswiped into serving tea. Um, and because I'm like part of the queer community as well as female, I massively resist just being on the kind of very stereotypical female, I'll pour your coffee. I just won't do it. And I felt like it was really good to be doing something much more kind of thinking as well. And I really enjoyed 
um, doing the talks and talking to other people. Um, I think, yeah, we got to be a bit silly as well. And Greenbelt is so much fun. It's just really worth, um, it's really worth going if you can. Uh, the second thing, stepwise, are discipleship courses in United Reformed Church. I wanted to deepen my discipleship a bit. I was thinking and praying about this from a few years ago. And I got really lucky with where I ended up, actually. I was doing stepwise discipleship courses online. Um, and my it turns out that my mentor, who is the Lancashire missional mentor, Dalian, is a real kindred spirit. She's really committed to eco-church and social justice and does a lot of work with supporting refugees as well. And so um, we just became kind of friends and real kindred spirits. And I really enjoyed studying and learning under her. And she's definitely really helped my discipleship development. But out of that relationship has grown. I'm now part of the green network of green apostles where I live in the URC. Um, and we really kind of work together on eco-church and other Eco developments, and I try and share as much as possible of anything I do with CCA into the URC and into our newsletters so that people may see it and get involved. And we're also starting to run things like I'm going to do a talk. I've done a talk in my church about the Camino. Fantastic talk, Julie. Thank you. It was so much fun. Um, but I'm going to go and do one in another URC to try and encourage people into Christian climate action because I think um, it felt definitely in the tent in the summer that there was quite an appetite for it. And so what happened was I did the Faith Hill Life Stepwise. I've done the community one and I did the worship one with Dalian and our Stepwise group, which has stayed together, we put a service together, which was assessed to pass the course. But then some of us elected to do extra work, to do a portfolio and to do an assessed service of our own. And so we've now just been recognised as locally recognised worship leaders. So the URC has accidentally set free a climate activist to go and talk in loads of their churches. But because a lot of us are aiming for Silver Eco Church, actually one of the things you can do on your tick list is get an activist to speak. And so I, I find that's a really good opportunity of opening up doors to try and get involved in um, encouraging people into activism. Um, so this is kind of about the making of an accidental lay worship leader. Um, I talked about the Camino in my assess service and I'll be leading worship on a similar theme in January. Um, and I feel kind of like quite uh, affirmed really, I suppose, with having this local worship leader title. I think it is worth going for that if you if you have the opportunity to go for anything similar, um, because churches are struggling for speakers, for talkers, for preachers a lot at the moment. And you can talk about green issues in churches and use it. Um, and so, yeah, I did a lot of um, um, work together with Dal Dalian and now with others who are joining, which is fantastic. Um, and because getting to silver eco church and bronze is about activism and lifestyles and thinking more globally, I'm really hoping to encourage my church and others to do that. And there's lots of brilliant people in my own church, two of whom own like a passive house. It's fantastic. And they open that up and people can go around and look at it. And then they host events where the money goes to India Fair Share. So there's a real kind of circular economy going on, which I really love. And then the last thing, which I'll talk very quickly about, um, our Methodist minister, Ian, is great and, and has put together Our Faith, Our Planet in Manchester, which is an interfaith group of people concerned about the climate crisis. And I was really honoured to be asked to go and talk um, at this this year. There was, and he made it quite interesting. So there was violinists at the start. There was a huge variety of, of people there. There were leaders from the Muslim and Jewish faith communities. Um, and I did a talk, which, which what I decided to do, so I didn't kind of kill people with PowerPoint, was I decided to read the poem that I'd written for our performance. After the Green Zone performance that we did in Glasgow, we did a little performance at the Institute for Contemporary Arts. And so I read the poem with the background of the slides for our Camino to give people a bit of a taster of it. And then we worked together on tables to write messages to COP from the young people from the interfaith communities that were there. Um, and my table decided to ask for payments of loss and damages for the hundred billion dollars in climate finance that's not been paid. Because it was an interfaith event, we linked this to reparations for slavery as well. And how actually if we repaid the global south for what we've stolen in terms of loss and damages through the climate crisis and in terms of those legacies, 
we would start to really see a rebalance in terms of social justice and environmentalism. And we also talked, Melanie and somebody else had sent this through on the CCA chats about the environmental activists that are in prison in Egypt and elsewhere and put that in our ask as well. So really felt like God is kind of guiding this and um, opening up opportunities. There are lots of spaces where people are desperate for speakers on the environment um, where people don't feel very confident and being part of cca will teach you a lot of, about spirituality being part of the activism will teach you a lot about how to take part in nonviolent direct action and being part of the saturday sessions has really really helped develop my theology i especially remember rachel's ross talk about the midwives in pharaoh's house and i very much feel like that i'm a total outsider in church circles i'm quite poor i have a disability i'm part of the queer community and i'm a staunch feminist i massively don't fit into church circles but through cca i've kind of started to realize that actually it's our voices and voices in particular from the global south even more that really need to be heard so I kind of feel yeah kind of happier on the inside outside edge where I am through doing this as well so I'm going to stop now because it's two minutes to 12. I'm sorry that was such a whistle stop tour but thank you very much Mel. <laughs> thank you Kathy. Right, we're, we're all back. I'm sorry that we're sort of running out of time. Um, what I'm going to say is that those who want to stay to have a discussion uh, or who want to ask any questions are most welcome to do so. But I just, in our last couple of uh, minutes, want to round up on, on all that. What you've been hearing um, about is just ordinary people in CCA who have got on and done what they feel uh, they can do in terms of mobilization. And it's really important to recognize that we can all do that. We can go out and talk in our church communities, we can talk uh, in our work environments, we can do all these sorts of things that bring around uh, people that join our movement. And we can go out and be proactive in joining groups that need uh, speakers like Kathy has done and talk about CCA and about activism. So people don't just stop at the recycling, reusing the, the three R's, but they get on and they actually use their voices. They get out on the streets, they um, approach their politicians, they move on and begin to think about nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. And this is a job that we can all take on, sharing this message that we all have that power. Um, so that's my invitation to you. And to say that if you need uh, inspiration or you need assistance, you can just email CCA. We actually have put together a template talk uh, and it's got uh, PowerPoint slides. It looks a little bit, it's a very basic talk, which is really suitable to go into churches with. We've got some notes on the PowerPoint and you can choose the bits that you uh, want to use. Um, so get in touch uh, or we can help you um, kind of think about how you might write your own. Just email us. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>